day folks a lot going on here i don't know where to start but some very good news it appears that i found a way well another way anyways an alternate method to basically eliminate the lens drag and essentially a little hint of tom bearden's four wave phase conjugate mixing so to correct the input as well so a lot going on here and please i hope you have been watching my latest videos about how i found some anomalies on using capacitors such as in this circuit here so when you feed them with through their virtual capacitors ac you get basically free rectification i was just messing around like this and these circuits by the way are all available in my previous videos which i encourage you to watch if you haven't to understand what i'm getting at so i guess i figured from the start folks that there was something here i just couldn't figure out couldn't get my fingers on it right but i was experimenting and experimenting and having the small inverter here and the lab bench power supply that allows me to see the current and the meters and everything something was brewing in my mind but i couldn't quite put my mind to it but needless to say, I put out these circuits because they were interesting and some people have been able to replicate them, by the way. So essentially here, unfortunately, it's clipped because of the way it printed, but th this transformer here would tap into the virtual C3 here and through a normal rectifier and load would run. And the capacitor's regular C1 would charge here and run a DC load without rectification on the input here. So the key here that made this all work is the non-symmetrical um, dielectric that allows this with the charge to happen through basically pure displacement currents. So that basically breaks the symmetry there, but gives us essentially an optional but usable reactive tap, right? Like we've been talking about earlier in my videos and reactive energy, how it's resonant. The load likes that because the input goes down and it appears that there's a gain, but it's out of phase. People can't use it and it's just all this trouble. And then you've got your lens drag and everything else, right? So needless to say, here I am looking at Don Smith stuff and looking at this. And then I figure, you know what? I think I fig I have an idea. So let me explain what I have did here. So I've used basically this concept here and I had this crazy idea with the Don Smith coils. And in some earlier videos, I had this concept where I explained how the power plant itself and big, and maybe I think Gerald Morin talked about that as well, how they have asynchronous phase condenser windings right at the plant, which act as dummy motors essentially to assess. So when you have the apparent power which is the S factor and the uh, reactive power and all that, the grid, you know, has, to, especially when there's all the commercial power factor correction, that goes back into the grid and they don't want to blow their stuff up. So they use these uh, asynchronous condenser windings to run passively in the line to basically smooth it out and re reinvert the phase, right? And back into usable power. So quietly, the power plants are using these kind of tricks, you know, but they don't advertise them to say like that, but some people um, have figured it out. So essentially looking into that, I'm like, you know what, this gives us a door, an opportunity right here. We have the reactive side, the non the asymmetric dielectric allows, what it does is in the reactive regime, it gives us like an additional lag we can take advantage of, you see, because it's asymmetrical. And that lag essentially, what I've learned today, is it allows you to split your output path in two. Your reactive path is on one side and your real power is on the other. So by doing that, essentially, one long story short, the power supply, which is right here, which would be your regular output here, feels that, that would, would, which would normally include your lens, which would introduce lens drag, that gets corrected and reflected back in there. And this load here runs very, very nicely. And the input power drops, right? So essentially, I want to explain how to get to this. Is back to Don Smith. So in, I, I figured, you know, instead essentially of having, like in an earlier video, I showed you like right here, I was running other transformers like a radio and everything and it appeared that the load was going down. I said, and I couldn't quite put my hands on it because everything I plugged in there would change the dynamics drastically. And that's when it hit me. Since it's reactive, I'll make it resonant. 
So back to Don Smith over here, believe it or not. And by the way, I think I was able to decode a part of Don Smith indirectly by playing with this as well. So I introduced this here talking about asynchronous phase um, condenser windings. This is essentially it, you know, but more solid state because you got your reactive zone here, asymmetrical. And then here I want to do a correction on the line. So instead, so right here, this is where I would have this coil connected. Now, I think Don Smith was a little bit dishonest in the way he explained things. Because when you see it on his board, it kind of looks like this, right? So at first you see, okay, so it's a regular, you know, butt resonant, fancy, primary, secondary, split, whatever, you know, air core. And that's sort of how he described it and showed you. But what I'm getting at is I think it was exclusively used as a passive phase corrector. So there's that asynchronous condenser winding. And the asymmetrical capacitor that I'm showing here, I think, was what Don Smith was hinting at with his plates and his charge without getting directly into it. So essentially, I think I cracked that in without notice realizing it, right? And also another thing is the secondary. See, it actually operates in reverse as to what Don Smith shows, you see? So the uh, output here goes into... This, the primary, which is the high Q side, which is the inside here, one big coil. And what I've done here, because it's a passive system, you've got your L2 and L3 here, but instead of connected them in, in the proper, like what would be the normal orientation, I, I crossed them so they're at opposite ends here. So essentially what that does is it creates a, 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 an alternate path and when you turn this on, you get a dual ringing. You get a dual resonant signal that basically hits on itself, which is very interesting. And because the way they're split, one side of it gives you the, um, what I said, it's like a four-way mixing. So you get the constructive interference, which adds on. So you got your constructive interference on one side, which is basically... <laughs> part of the uh, what would be the correction wave that comes in right which enhances in Tom Bearden's uh, philosophy and then this side here which actually does like the scalar component which actually neutralizes the drag of lens so this bounces back into our transformer here which is this so this experience is nearly no drag gets the boost from the wave correction and appears to run again and a boost in voltage and I will show you this running right now so what's also interesting and in this mode which is a very good sign the C1 here which I have on the meter doesn't significantly raise voltage because it gives us the good sign that the capacitor is really active even as the virtual sides in this mode as reactive but asymmetrical and this is where the symmetry breaking it at the capacitor allows us to split the reactive and real power paths as we're doing here and offer the correction coil so that it bounces, reflect its back into this side here and reuse as a regular load. So I'm going to show you this here and I've got the scope by the way, which is super interesting on the output side of this coil to show you what it's doing internally. And you realize how a normal wavefront, you know, it's like this and like that. So we don't have two channels. I want to remind you, just one channel is connected. And you're going to see like an accordion like waveform with, with those very high frequency ringing, which is basically a good sign for resonance and reactive power. But the two sides are slightly out of phase. You'll see that it's not a complete one to one accordion. So in essentially, what in, again, it'll just show you that what's going on is it's constructively fixing the wave and also fighting off the lens drag on the other side. So I will show you that now. So here's the load. This is the power transformer, which would be this here. And this is our load, but we have a meter that shows the power to the load and the current, the amperage that is being used and I have the current here which is my inverter which runs the whole thing like this into the input with AC so we're going to turn this on now so you see the draw here which is not bad 
So 12.5 volts, about 290. And on the output, we're getting, we're peaking at 14 volts. And the output shows, you see that over 370. This is very primitive equipment, by the way, 400, because it's always varying with all the ripple in the background there, 500, 400. But you see, this one here is, is acting relatively stable at 280, 12.5. Here we're getting 13, 14 and really high peaks, like almost half an amp. So there's a potential gain quickly looking at it here, which is the best I've had, by the way, with this system. You could say about COP 1.25 right now, roughly. Just on this side here. So here's the scope and that, there's that like accordion I was talking about, but with the offset on the plus and the minus side and then the slow wave. So you've got the resonant, you've got two resonant systems, L1 and, no sorry, L2 and L3, hitting on itself. And one is correcting, the other one is enforcing. Or in better terms, one is fixing the input and the other one is fighting off the lens drag. Reflecting this, this, and as you see, that there's a lot going on here, right? And it's, Reflecting it back into this one here, running our load at higher voltages, higher power, with a modest drop even on the input here. Now this is very interesting, and again it's connected completely different as to what Don Smith was doing, but this is probably what he was doing. It was just a passive phase corrector, and he disguised it as this was his actual transducer, while the load is actually over here doing its thing. You see? And it was a special capacitor, as you know. But you gotta realize, right, folks, if, if, if we're getting, you know, a couple hundred milliamps more here at a few volts higher, that might just be, you know, let's say, quickly speaking, a few watts, right? But when you go with a high voltage like Don Smith was doing, those, those, those milliamps that we're talking about, a, a gain of maybe 100 could be like 100 watts, right? So this is, you know, it can be scaled up is what I'm getting at. And uh, this stays relatively stable. And what's interesting here, there are peaks who hear it going for no reason. Well, there is a reason, but you know. Um, these things here are very sensitive to the environment, time of the day, which, which orientation they're placed, that kind of thing, right? But it is picking up massive peaks. And... Um, we haven't even covered that we can use this side here to charge a battery while this is doing its thing, right? And showing us a game. So crudely speaking, it does two things in one. One side corrects the lens drag and the other side does the phase correction, the time replicate wave that Tom Bearden was talking about. So that's why we see a small gain is because that's the corrective wave adding on and then the, the, the lens going down so the two give you a much more efficient on the output. Now of course folks there is like a magnetic equivalent to all this but you're not gonna get a high output because using magnetic cores you, you, you tighten up your flux right so a very, very, I guess, simplified version of this would be here. So this would be your big core here. This is core one. And then you drive your windings there. My apologies doing this all in one hand here. So this is your L1, you drive it, okay? 
So what you do here is you put another coral, I mean core, about half the size, right next to it here. And then another core split, but very close to it. And of course geometry and distance and all that matters, right? But there's all sites and, and ideas about that if you want to do the research. But my point is what I'm doing here can be very simplified on the magnetic side. It may help you understand what's going on. So now what we do here is we coil these two here together in another loop. And then on the opposite side here, I'm not sure if I did that opposite, but the point is the two have to be opposite fed, sidewise, and um, it's hard to do with one hand. And then the output, you get one output here, one out, and they're combined, right? But they're opposite. I'm having a hard time drawing this, but I hope you see what I mean. And then this side here is combined, but there's a gap here. And this becomes your output. And it'll do very much like what we're seeing here, highly simplified, right, on the magnetic side. So what happens is essentially um, you're, fight, you're neutralizing the lens through the magnetic ends of things. But the issue here is because you're using cores here magnetically, this tightens your flux quite a bit. So even though you're going to get the um, Tom Bearden effect of the correction of the input, your flux confines most of those gains so you're going to get what you're supposed to at your output you're going to get a slight gain maybe a 20 ma or so i'm going to make a quick guess here over the top of what you're already putting in which isn't bad but it's not commercial quality and you can't do much with it but of course you could run an led or something in a self loop which in theory should run forever Highly simplified, but because of the simplicity comes the limitation that this kind of system can't really produce that high of an output. So probably Don Smith knew that, and that's why he wanted to go through the air core method instead, at super high frequency, super high voltage to make the effect more pronounced, right? So this is just food for thought, trying to show you all. But yeah, this is what's going on here, thanks to this. So this is the most success I've had so far with this setup here, which shows me very, um, to me anyways, obvious clear gains. And everything kind of seems to make sense, tying all the pieces together here. So I just thought I'd share that. And until next time, folks.